So every time I sing, I saw the light at home, I start to speak southern for a few hours. I'm going to try not to do that. Mark 14 <clears throat> describes what must have been one of the most difficult times in Christ's life. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. And now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And then they laid hands on him and arrested him. One of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then all of them deserted him and fled. So we can truly only imagine what it was like for Christ, but we can imagine some parts of it. The basic assignment was go down and become a living sacrifice for these folks so that they may be redeemed and, and they might uh, stay with God throughout eternity. That's a clear enough mission. And, and the New Testament records that he knew what he was doing and, and one way or another he headed towards Jerusalem with stops along the way but always inevitably toward that time of great sacrifice. So he knew what it was that he was asked and called to do and when he made the decision to do that, which might have occurred in the desert or might have occurred in some way we don't understand, it must have been made with a deep and passionate love for the people that his father had created. To be willing to go forward and sacrifice for us because he loved us is the main message of Christianity that you receive. Yes, nod your head if that, that's true. Yeah. So, Consider that when we hear the story of Judas and know that the story of Judas is one instance in many, especially towards the close of his life, when he must have had pause to wonder if we were worth it. He hadn't done anything to Judas that would have caused Judas to betray him to be arrested and then to hasten his death. Nothing. As far as we know, Judas was if you can be in such a small group, relatively a, a no account, just a hanger on, going to see the miracles and participate in, in the glory days and, and uh, staying with the group. But he's not mentioned or called out anywhere else in, in the New Testament. And, and yet, after having received the ministry of Christ, seen the power of Christ, uh, received the teachings of Christ, Judas, for his own reasons, and, and the simple explanation is for 30 pieces of silver, I think that's just... Uh, well, I don't really think that he sold him out for money. I think he sold him out because he had to sell him out if Judas wanted to remain king of his own life. He couldn't afford for Jesus to ascend and be sacrificial and do the things that he was going to do and hang on to his own vision of reality, Judas's reality. So he sold him down the river to, to get rid of him in order to maintain what he believed to be the truth about life. If you're Jesus sitting at the table and you know that Judas is going to head out of that dinner and uh, go and give a sign, do you spill the wine on him accidentally? Do you load up uh, and, and undercut him by the things you're saying, not overtly to him, but just in the way that you say him? Do you talk about people who uh, aren't trustworthy being a problem in this world and how... Nope, not if you're Christ. You just look at him and know he's like all the rest. And he's going to do what he's going to do. And it doesn't change what you have to do. And you maintain or you retain or you recall the great love that caused you to be willing to do what you were going to do anyway. And then I guess you hold your breath and you go and do it. In our faith, we are constantly trapped between two realities. 
The first reality says that when someone betrays you, when someone lies to you or hurts you or deceives you or does other horrible things to you, which is why we're in the forgiveness challenge in, in this time of year, the, the world says and you instinctually believe that if you could get back at them, even the score, or maybe even get a little bit ahead for their own good so they'll never forget the lesson. If, if you could find a way to reset the truth so that all things are equal and, and no one has gotten ahead of you at all, if, if you could repay an eye for an eye, then it would be okay. If you've taken revenge in your life, at the same measure that someone hurt you, or even worse, has it, in fact, made your life better? I've never heard anyone testify to that, although it seems to be the common truth that we pursue. No one has ever stood up in a church service, certainly, or, or anywhere else that I've seen, and, and said, right, my life was, was a disaster, my uh, spouse cheated on me, my, my kids re rebelled, my uh, partner in business cheated on me, and, and I systematically set my mind to doing nothing but repaying them in kind for the next five years, right? I destroyed those people at the same level they destroyed me. I took away all in their life that was good and, and wondrous, and I made them hurt as much as I hurt, and now I am free, free at last and full of joy. You've never heard that, have you? Anywhere. Do you know why? Because it isn't true. There, the world is full of people who have, in fact, taken revenge, right? Have, have had the mindset, I'll show you. And they've done what they had to do to set the score equal. And the world is full of people who should have the good sense to know, my God, that doesn't work, right? If by work you mean make your life full of joy or, or bring you peace or, or make your life what you sense that it could be and it isn't. We are torn in, in a, a world that wages war on a, on a world scale with the insane idea that war itself, the ultimate manifestation of getting our enemies back, can somehow bring about what we desire, but it historically only provides fodder for more war, even if several generations pass before that happens. Revenge is simply not the answer, not because of some moral imperative, but because it's a broken system and it doesn't work. It doesn't make you happier. You can say what you want. You can do what you want. You can pursue your enemies. You could have called Judas out at the table if you were Christ. I suppose you could have killed him with a look. But it doesn't produce what it promises. It's a lie. Nod, and I'll get off that. If you came into church this morning thinking that your happiness is just a matter of the right circumstances happening so that you can get back at whoever has hurt you, you are absolutely wrong. And, and the hardest part of being wrong in that way is you're just wasting your time and you don't have that much left. Even if you're a very young person, you do not have a lot of time in life to mess around thinking that destroying somebody else is going to somehow build you up. It doesn't work that way. So that's the one truth that seems to be as natural to us as, as breathing, which is if I could just hurt all the people that have hurt me, life would be better. And the other truth is even more ridiculous and harder to believe in, which is why we stay with the temptation to repay evil for evil. The other truth is Christ's teaching, which is if somebody hurts you, if somebody really sets out to wound you and they do a, an excellent job so that they shake your foundations and they, and they make you feel like life is a horrible affair and you don't know if you'll ever get over it and, and you're flooded with that horror, what you should do is nothing. Unless, of course, they need something and then you should give them what they need. That sounds like abject nonsense, doesn't it? What kind of crazy world would that produce? Really, what kind of world would that produce? We don't have any idea, because we've only ever tried the other theory. It's true. What kind of reality would it produce in you, or me, or, or the church, or, or on any level? If we were to go around, and, and when people were terrible, and, and acted out, and, and hurt, and, and did things that were despicable and dishonest, we just went about our business, and continued to try to serve Christ, and worked on forgiving until we could let go of it, and then just move by as if the bad that people do is just a stench in life that's best walked around. Things you should be thinking of if you haven't, I'll help you with that. That's insane. It won't work because it lets bad people off the hook and they'll just get better at being bad. Did you think of that or did I help you? 
It doesn't make any sense. Really, it doesn't, right? And I'm not playing. I'm telling you the truth. On the surface level, it makes no sense to do what Christ said, which is just turn the other cheek and let them have a, a go at it. They're bad people. That's why they did bad things. Am I, am I correct? Can I get an amen? You say, you must know a better class of people than I do. If you give bad people a chance to be bad again, what do you suppose will happen? They'll be bad again. And when they practice being bad, they will get better at being bad. So they could be the baddest bad that you've ever known. It seems then a moral imperative to check that behavior. And how do you do that? By seeking revenge. Add a little extra. No, we already discovered that doesn't work, does it? On the one hand, taking revenge leads to your wasting your time here. On the other hand, it's insane to think that you should just let go when somebody has done something really genuinely horrible to you. No one thinks that. That's out of reality. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servants, girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, you also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. He denied it, saying, I don't know or understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the forecourt, and then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them, but again he denied it. And then after a while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, which they could tell by his southern accent. (laughs) But he began to curse, and he swore an oath. I do not know this man you are talking about. I've often thought in that instant when he said, I do not know this man that you're talking about, there is no greater truth in the Bible. Peter couldn't have been further away from the reality of knowing who Jesus was or what he stood for at that time. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time, and then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times, and he broke down, and he wept. So, it's insane to think that we can just ignore the damage that other people do to us. We're talking about horrible things in in life, and it doesn't work to seek revenge. It's worth knowing that it doesn't work to seek revenge, not just because you waste your life in trying to accomplish something that's a fool's game and can't be accomplished, but because when you seek revenge, when you look for a way to get even, what you do is make a free will choice to become your enemy who you despise because of their moral character. If you actually were to get revenge, then you would have lowered yourself to the standard of the person who hurt you in the first place, and that's insane. It's insane to say, just let it go, but it, it, it's crazy making. I mean, honestly, just it make your head explode if you stop and think rationally about the other plan. If you seek revenge and you actually get it, you have now become more despicable than the person that you despise because they took away some of your innocence. And who has that as a master plan for their life? What would you do with yourself, says the Lord on Judgment Day? I became as despicable as I possibly could, but no one ever beat me. We're caught in a seriously hard place, aren't we? Christianity too often refuses to stand up to to the difficulty of the question that's being posed today and instead becomes a religion of, well, just ask God for things like promotions or whatever, get over the sniffles, whatever it is that you pray for every day. Pray for that stuff and, and, and ignore the big questions, right? Which means you can systematically feel like you're a Christian and pursue the end of teaching your enemy a lesson. But that isn't what Christ taught. There's no record of him saying just anything your little heart desires. That's what God has come to give you. The record says clearly that what you really need is what he came to give you, even though if you accept it, you'll have to choke it down. Because it's really, really hard, not only intellectually to believe the gospel, but to act on it, to to go against what you would call our nature, given that we're fallen, is an exceptionally difficult thing. So it's easier just to go another path. But in this season, anyway, we're not doing Christianity light, we're doing Christianity. And Jesus was pretty unbending in his idea that the way we should treat our enemies and those who hurt us is to work the process of forgiveness. To remind you of the steps, the first step, somebody 
hurts you or injures you or, or does wrong to you. When the incident is over, you should immediately begin to tell the story. First, inside, you'll rehearse the hurt and, and, and the harm and, and the self-justification that goes with it. And, and then later, to other people, neutral parties who weren't injured there, you should tell the story and you should tell it from as many perspectives as you possibly can until you latch on to a perspective in which the person who hurt you becomes again a human being. And not only a human being, but a human being who is in the broadest sense equal with you. So if someone lies to you and as a result of that lie, they gain whatever it is that you think is valuable in life. You'll have to tell that story of that fraud and that lie and that person and that situation until you can back off to see the situation from their perspective, from what made them that way or what made them think that I, I was the kind of person they should do that to until you can humanize them. And the ultimate end of that is to say, I can at least conceive that in my life, given the same set of circumstances and the same viewpoint, I might have considered acting the same. If you can tell the story over and over and over again until you can step into the shoes, which doesn't make their action right, but makes them human, and at the human level they're equal with you, you've taken a significant step forward because there's no room in telling the story for plotting revenge. You're just looking for a way to understand how could someone else who was a creation of God, someone else who Christ found worthy to die for, someone else who has been given the precious gift of life, how could someone else equal unto me do something so despicable? And the answer is, you already full well know, because everybody in this place, everyone who's ever drawn breath, really has done something despicable at some point. But in order not to go insane, you have to work the story until you can see that, until you can square it up. And, and in order to square it up and, and remember that you could have done the same thing or, or might have in another circumstance and equalize them with you, you may have to tell the story a thousand times. It takes a long time to get past the hurt enough to see a human being acting out. The second step, then, is to calculate exactly what it cost you, exactly what was taken away from you, what value it has, and, and what it is that you're going to have to forgive. And, and we frequently find in forgiveness uh, challenge in, in the steps that even in the most heinous of situations, the, the damage is much more limited than it feels when you are injured. So the, the damage feels like it will twist you forever and you'll never be the same, but nobody actually has that power because God gave you free will. The damage is limited. You might feel like, I can never, ever trust again, but that's a universal truth and it's untrue. Of course you'll trust again. You may not trust that person again, and you may not trust that situation again, but you'll trust again so the damage is more limited than you think. Are you still with me? Okay. You guys either look guilty or sleepy. I can't tell the difference which is actually a fine thing in a pastor, right? I'm just going to assume you're sleepy. So the first two steps, telling the story until you can tell the story from their perspective, even though you will still disagree with it and it doesn't lessen the hurt, it's important to know that's just another human being doing what human beings do, and human beings includes you. And then to calculate what the actual damage was, oftentimes, though I don't want to be too uh, halcyon in my thinking, oftentimes the damage is way less than the good that can come of having been hurt in the first place if it deepens your faith and broadens your understanding of your own existence. And then the, what is the next step? So we've told the story until we can see it from their perspective and humanized our enemies, and then we've counted the damage, right? What's actually been done to us, and, and what is that doggone third step? I, I knew it would, you'd struggle with it. Forgive, right? That's what we gathered here to, today to discuss. All those in favor of just singing a song and going home. <laughs> it feels like you're cheating yourself when you make the decision to forgive. Does it not? Like you're, like you're closing a door that might open sometime. So I put my rock back on the altar uh, this morning, and I'm happy to do so. But I will tell you that before that rock would go up there, uh, I wanted to be super Christian, be the first one up there, but didn't make it. And I didn't make it because I, I kept struggling with, yeah, yeah, well, okay, fine. But I might have a chance to get them back, right? And I'd sure hate to make a promise that I'm not willing to keep. That <laughs> right between the two realities, right? So the third step is forgiveness, and I thought it would be a fine idea if we went over what forgiveness is so that you would know exactly what it is before you try to give it. Can I get an amen for that? 
Forgiveness is a state of super spirituality where you are so good that the whole world notices and can't believe that you are now ready to ascend to the Lord. So anybody want to come up and show us a picture of that? Yeah, no. That's what you think it is, though, doesn't it? Right? You, you think it, uh, forgiveness should be a lot sweeter than this, right? If I'm going to forgive somebody, I, I should feel better about it, or I should be smiling, or, or whatever. It should be relatively easy. Uh, that might be. And if you know somebody who is a great Christian, you should ask them. I will tell you my own experience, not so much. I have been able to forgive even in the midst of lots of turmoil and and anger and and, uh, bad stuff left in my system because I've come to understand that forgiveness is something radically different than I thought. I thought it was full release and and not having any hurt having to do with the whatever happened before, but uh, if that were truly what forgiveness to forgive somebody is that you could reset it and go back to before you ever hurt no one would ever forgive and christ would be asking something impossible for us you know that's true don't you so since he did require of us that we forgive it makes sense to me that it must be something much more practical and i'm going to take a guess i can tell you that this is a guess that actually works in my life i hope that it would yours too here's my guess that forgiveness, like most everything else in a, the world, is a free will decision, and it's a contractual obligation, if you want to use those words, that you're willing to make with God and then be held accountable for. So, in my case, and I trust it would be yours too, forgiveness was as simple as this. When I laid the rock on the altar, I said, feeling, I'm going to say, 70-30 for the decision. Just telling the truth, right? 70% of me is positive, 30% still hedging. But I laid the rock on the altar and I said this. I promise you, Lord, that even if the opportunity arises, I will not pull the trigger. I won't say bad things about them anymore. I won't bring it up again if I had the chance in the future. I'm just going to ignore it and let it be now. I will not take the opportunity to revenge, even if it's served up on a platter. I promise you this with all of my heart. Now that I'm 100% in for. Because I know when I make a covenant with God in that way, it's a serious business. And if the opportunity does come, that will help check my behavior. And as far as I can tell today, that's what's required of me. That is forgiveness in its essence. Saying to yourself and saying to your God, even if the opportunity comes to redress this wrong and to feel like I've gotten even, I will not take it. Here is my sacred promise to you. I am leaving whatever happens because of this up to you, Lord, and I remove myself from the judge's chair. Does that make sense? I see people nodding. It makes sense because you can actually do it, can't you? Right? I wouldn't want to make that promise and then go back on it. That would be, I think, a disaster for your own soul, and you'd have to forgive yourself, and that's a whole other twisted universe. But to, to say to God, it, it is right, my promise to you that whatever happens, it's up to you, has a strange and almost immediate effect, and the effect is relief. I'll describe it in, in a terrible, terrible way. You know how when you eat something that you really shouldn't have eaten because it turns out you can't leave a can in the kitchen open that long? (laughs) And and you feel it within about five minutes and it starts to do this thing, right? And, And you know, oh man, it's just a matter of time. And you know that if you threw up, you'd feel better, but you still go take Pepto-Bismol in the insane hope that you can keep poison in your body? Do you know what I'm talking about, right? Because that is an insane hope. When you need to throw up poison food, you should throw it up because you were designed that way to live. But you try to calm the stomach anyway. Well, the way you feel after you throw up and you know the poison's out and, and that's how that feels, to put a rock on the altar. I'd like to use glowy terms and tell you that it resulted in weight loss and less wrinkles, but <laughs> it didn't. I just feel relieved and glad to have the poison out and glad to have made a promise to the one that I tried my hardest to keep my promises to. No more smack talk, no more revenge. Even in my mind, I have promised God that when it comes up, I'm going to try now to quit rehearsing it. Just let it be. Because really, bottom line, they didn't do anything worse to me than I have done to other people. If I can remember that and hang on to it, there's a chance still in this life that I'll find sanity, isn't there? So, 
I made a list, eight helpful things about forgiveness. Are you ready? You're going to want to write these things down or memorize them. One, to forgive means that you're vowing to hold no grudges for the past wrongs and to take no actions against them. Two, it means uh, that, uh, again, no personal action to seek revenge, even if the person is just absolutely in your sights. Three, it means you recognize the full humanity of the one who hurts you and you are aware that all humans have the same value to their maker. It means that we are willfully turning judgment over to God. Now, I will tell you, uh, not today, but at other times when, when I have worked the process of forgiving, for, uh, I have found great solace in that idea, right? So sometimes it has been that I have said, all right, I, I won't do anything more along these lines, but I'm just going to set it aside. But then I have simultaneously asked God, please memorize this, right? I, I think they should be punished. I'm just not going to do it. You giggle, but I'm telling them God's honest truth, right? So he knows everything, and he knows how bad some people are. (laughs) Once you turn judgment over to God, it means releasing yourself from the impossible responsibility to judge other human beings. Five, it does not mean that you should or must interfere in any legal process, which is a result of others' actions, uh, this is a, an argument that is made constantly by people who are struggling with forgiveness and, and struggle they should, uh, right? So usually it is in the um, made-up realm. You mean if uh, a drunk driver uh, killed my child that I should ask them not to be prosecuted and, and have to go to jail? No, that's not what it means at all. It, it means that you personally have given up your right to seek retribution. You don't have the right to ask for Christian forgiveness on the, on the level of society or even on the level of other people. They have to take care of their own business. So it doesn't mean that you would interfere in a legal process for someone who has done something illegal. It means that you would personally have forgiven them. That's a big difference, and it should feel better to know that. It does not mean that you will no longer feel a hurt or have times when we return to anger. Do you all know what projection is? I always hesitate to, to um, talk about this because I don't want to instruct people in it. <laughs> That's hilarious if you have any counseling background. <laughs> so projection goes like this. Let's say that I had a fifth grade teacher who was mean to me and, and uh, particularly called me out or, or made fun of me for uh, my weight. And let's say that he's no longer a part of my life. And in fact, I'm in my 30s now. And somebody else who is in a position of authority also derides me in public about my weight. And in that instance, I have a meltdown, a, a, a vociferous and hideous amount of anger that gets poured out at that person for making a joke. That's projection, and what it means is I'm preloaded for it, right? So I had to eat a bunch of nonsense from somebody before, and I just stuffed it down, and then this person opened that channel, and they get more than their fair share of the poison that's built up. That's projection. So we project onto other people unfinished business from the past. Everybody understand that? Okay, now let's think through this. This is a moment of pity for senior pastors. If you... If you're an authority figure in the church and your job is to stand up every week and tell people that they're sinners and they need redemption, do you think people project onto you? (laughs) I've not experienced it, but other pastors have told me that it does happen. (laughs) So, projection is a mechanism by which we can understand how much we might have healed after we have made the claim of forgiveness in somebody's life. So let's say you were cheated in a business deal and you're in the midst of negotiating another business deal and you have an inkling that the other person might have motivations that are wrong. If that feeling is stronger than is merited by the situation, it means that you're still carrying some of the old hurt, right? You're projecting uh, the the past hurt on on the situation. It's not a bad or a good thing. It's just a human thing. It's, it's, It's what we do. That should decline over time in similar circumstances as a sign of God blessing you in your forgiveness. And I tell you this because a truth of forgiving someone is that it continues to hurt what they did to you even after you forgive them. It's unrealistic to think, I won't have any more pain once I say I forgive them. Right? Even if you say it to them, the pain will all be gone and it'll it'll all be better. That's insane. You're not constructed that way. 
you'll continue to hurt and, and be angry and upset when uh, the same circumstances manifest or, or sometimes when the same season comes, comes along, uh, same whatever, the, that old injury is still there and it will still hurt. But it doesn't have to have primary place in your hurt and it doesn't have to cause you to change your decided upon reaction to it. So forgiveness does not mean that suddenly you feel all better and you don't have any more negative feelings or distrust. Of course you do. You're a human being. It means that you've done the right thing that God asked you to do and said, I'm not going to take revenge even when I have, have those feelings. And, and really, it should mean, if we have any sense, that I'm going to discover about myself when I project and I'm going to try really hard to take the wrong person, right? I'm not even all that mad at them, off of the judgment seat. You will still feel anger and hurt and loss if someone has done something terrible to you for all the days of your life. It's just that that won't be your primary feeling. The power of forgiveness is that it opens up other areas in your life so that instead of walking around wounded all the time and, and, and just feeling like it's a horrible life, horrible world, etc., you're allowed then to take uh, the vacuum that you have created and, and let God fill it up with other things with more joy and more peace and more hope and more fresh outlook. That's the end result. You're freed from the clutches of your enemy. It does not mean that <clears throat> we must or should put ourselves in a position to be hurt in the same fashion again. And, and I know the scripture. Uh, who, who has a happy thought about that? Jesus said, turn the other cheek 77,000 times or until they kill you. Okay, great. I'm going to be honest with you and tell you I'm just going to fail that one. I am. Sometimes I have to go back for more, right, with my family members because I can't get rid of them. So I'm working the 77 on some of, some of them, right, or really trying to. But if it's a situation where I don't have to go back for more pain, I ain't going back. I'm going to try to forgive and get on with my life, and, and I'll uh, take it up with Christ and, uh, on, on Judgment Day and, and, and want to be forgiven. But you don't need to necessarily go back and, and deal with the person who raped you or beat you physically or emotionally scarred you to the point where uh, it debilitated you. You don't have to go back for more. You just don't have to. I promise, right? Sometimes uh, you'll want to because you love the person and you want to get past the injury. Other times it's insane. So don't be insane. Don't go back. Don't put yourself in a situation where there's going to be more hurt. You have to have a chance to heal. Forgiveness does not mean being a sap and, and allowing someone who is sick to re-injure you over and over and over again. It does not mean that we want to have a relationship <clears throat> or that we're going to reset the relationship to what it was before because those things are untruths. They're not even possible to do. You, you do know that, yes? We talked about it last week. You can't go back. You can't. You can exercise. You can whiten your teeth. You can lose weight. Right? You can do all, all kinds of stuff to make yourself look like you used to look, but you can't go back. You can't go back relationally. You can't go back in any way, shape, or form. You can't go back. The past is now done. So if you think that forgiving your spouse is going to mean that you become young and impassioned in love, in, in that uh, crazy blind love that uh, encompasses us all at first, because you forgave them, you're going to be massively disappointed. And in that massive disappointment, if that's the expectation you have, you're likely to give up on the idea of forgiving because it won't work that way either. Am I making sense? Okay, just one more time and then I'll let it be. You can't go back. You're not getting younger and you can't reset a relationship to what it is. You can deepen a relationship and actually grow from the scars and have the relationship be better than you ever imagined. That has been my experience in two very good marriages. But I've not yet found a way to go back and be a knuckleheaded 18-year-old falling in love with some woman. Doesn't happen. You can only go forward, and the promise is, in forgiving those who you are very close to, the relationship deepens and becomes something better. And the reason? Because when you forgive, you are trustworthy. When you are trustworthy, your spouse or friend or person that's in, in your life, even if they refuse to acknowledge it, knows that there is a quality about you that is really beautiful, and they will respond to that quality. We all seek out the company of people who are really good at being above the fray and forgiving and getting on with their lives because they have that aspect of holiness that forgiveness and working forgiveness gives a person. That's what makes those people that we're drawn to. They practice this discipline over and over. 
but you can't go back. And, and frankly, why would you want to? Who sits here today dumber than you were 10 years ago? Nobody, right? You, you gained wisdom. And how would you get that wisdom? The hard way. Is there anybody who knows? A, 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 I would be happy to give the floor to anybody who knows how to get it the easy way. So it's as simple as this. We like the symbol of the stone in your hand, right? Place it on the altar and you say, I relinquish what I believe to be my moral right to say nasty things about this person (laughs) and to hurt them. I'm leaving it up to you, Lord. Please get them for me. Or don't. It's up to you. Did you ever think that forgiveness was that easy? Luke 23, two others also who were <clears throat> criminals, and I don't know if that's worse than being a liar or a deserter, which is what Judas and Peter were, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Just as simple as that, isn't it? Have I talked anybody into trying forgiveness as opposed to revenge? Anybody? So I have a prayer here that's oddly formal because when I do hard stuff, I revert to um, uh, seminary, Steve. But it it contains all of the things that we talked about today, and I will read it to you in an attitude of prayer. You can make it your prayer as we go along. If, If not, if you're not at a point where you're ready to forgive whoever it is that you might have on your heart, at least you will hear in this prayer the idea that I'm proffering today, that the actual act of forgiveness, the the doing of the the thing, is much more simple and, and easy than we might think at the beginning of the process. And here's how it looks in prayer form. So if you'll adopt an attitude of prayer. Lord, you are the giver of all forgiveness. The cross is a constant reminder of the depth and pain that you were willing to suffer in order to forgive us and to create new opportunities for us to have a loving relationship with you. We thank you for those things. We thank you for your son and for his sacrifice for us. And we accept his forgiveness and treasure its power in our lives. Lord, we want to honor you and follow your example by forgiving those who have hurt us for what they've done to us. You know better than we do what has happened, and you know much better than we do why. We know only that we are hurt and lessened by these things. Still, we know that we must forgive for what they have done, and so we do forgive. Lord, where our hearts are free for having done this, thank you. And where hearts are still bound to the past, we ask that you would help to continue to forgive until freedom is attained. Pour out your Holy Spirit on this gathering of people and all anywhere who desire to let go of the past and to move forward in your way instead of the ways of the world. And finally, Lord, we ask that you would bless those that have hurt us. Truly, bless them with the power of your Spirit and forgiveness and your grace. Restore them to proper relationship with you. We ask these things in the knowledge that they are also forgiven and that in that forgiveness they might begin to heal. Amen. So I invite you this week, set aside time. You can come into the sanctuary all throughout the week or if this is not the place for you to do it, to take your rock to wherever it would be meaningful for you and to let it go. And as you do, to simply tell God the truth, right? I forgive them. I will seek no more harm in them. I leave that up to you. And then ask God to restore and to renew your heart, and he will.